Hello everyone, let's review the autumn semester of the analysis module. First, let's discuss the fundamental theorem of algebra. It says that every polynomial equation with complex coefficients has a solution in the field of complex numbers. A consequence of this is that every polynomial p of x with complex coefficients can be factored as p of x is equal to x minus alpha 1 to the n1 times all the way up to x minus alpha m to the nm for a i in the complex numbers and n i in the integers. We also say that the complex numbers with addition and multiplication are algebraically closed. Now, let's review some notation for complex numbers. Given z equals a plus ib in the complex numbers with ab reals, we call a the real part of z, denoted re z, and call b the imaginary part of z, denoted im of z. The complex number a minus ib is called the complex conjugate of z, and is denoted by z bar, and is obtained by reflecting z along the real axis. The real number, the square root of a squared plus b squared, is called the modulus of z and is denoted like this. Hence, we have that 1 over z is equal to z bar divided by the modulus of z squared. Now, let's move on to discussing polar coordinates. Let cis of theta equal cos theta plus i sine theta. If z does not equal 0, then there is a unique theta in the range from minus pi to pi, such that z is equal to the modulus of z cis theta. This theta is called the principal argument of z, but we will sometimes refer to it as simply the argument of z, and is denoted arg z. Next, let's give some results from using polar coordinates. Let z1 equal r1 cis theta1 and z2 equal r2 cis theta2. Then, z1 times z2 is equal to r1 times r2 cis theta1 plus theta2. Hence, the argument of z1 times z2 is equal to the argument of z1 plus the argument of z2. Also, we have that z times z bar is equal to the modulus of z squared. Further, given any complex number z, iz is the result of rotating z anticlockwise about the origin by pi on 2 radian. We also have de Moivre's formula, which says that for all r greater than or equal to 0, theta, and every n greater than or equal to 1, we have that r cis theta to the n is equal to r to the n cis n theta. Also, we have that for all z equal to r cis theta in the complex numbers but not 0, and all integers n greater than or equal to 1, the n nth roots of z are given by zk is equal to the nth root of r times cis of theta plus 2 pi k over n for k from 0 to n minus 1. Now let's move on to discussing geometric shapes in the complex plane. Circles are given by the equation the modulus of z minus a is equal to r where a as a complex number is the center and r greater than 0 is the radius. Also if b is in the complex numbers but not 0 then the line through the origin in the direction of b is the set of all points of the form tb where t is a real number. Hence, the general equation of a line passing through the points z1 and z2 in the complex plane is given by z is equal to z1 plus t times z2 minus z1. Also, we have that the set of all z such that the imaginary part of z minus a divided by b greater than 0 is the half plane determined by the line through A parallel to B and in the direction to the left of B. Further, note that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the unit sphere in R cubed minus the north pole and the complex plane. We now want to move on to discuss linear order, so we need to define a binary relation. A binary relation on a set X is a collection of ordered pairs in X times X. Now we can define a linear order. A linear order on a set X is a binary relation less than or equal to on X with the following properties. For all X and Y in X, exactly one of the following must hold x less than y, y less than x, or x is equal to y. We also require that less than or equal to be transitive, i.e. for all x, y, z in x, if x is less than or equal to y, and y is less than or equal to x, then x is less than or equal to z. Further, we must have that for all x in x, x is less than or equal to x. If x is less than or equal to y, and y is less than or equal to x, then x equals y. Next, let's recall some basic properties of the normal linear order on the real numbers. First, for all x and y in R, if x is greater than 0, and y 
is greater than zero, then x times y is also greater than zero. Second, for all x in the real numbers, we have that x is greater than zero if and only if minus x is less than zero. Hence, there is no linear order on c which extends from the real numbers. In particular, there is no linear order less than star on the complex numbers with the following properties. For all x and y in the complex numbers, if zero is less than star x and zero is less than star y, then zero is less than star xy. And for all x in the complex numbers, we have that zero is less than star x if and only if minus x is less than star zero. We now want to discuss metric spaces, so let's define a metric space. Let x be a set and let d from x to x to the real numbers be a function. Then d is a metric if and only if the following hold for all x, y, and z in x. First, d of xy is greater than or equal to zero. Second, d of xy is equal to zero if and only if x is equal to zero. Third, d of xy is equal to d of yx. Fourthly, we require the triangle inequality, i.e. d of xz is less than or equal to d of xy plus d of yz. A pair x and d is a metric space if d is a metric on x. Now let's give some examples of metric spaces. First, the real numbers with its usual distance as a metric is an example of a metric space. Second, the complex numbers with metric given by the modulus function is also a metric space. Now, let's move on to define continuity on a general set. Let x with d and y with rho be metric spaces, f from x to y be a function, and let x naught be an x. We have that f is continuous at x naught if and only if for every epsilon in the real numbers with epsilon greater than zero, there is some delta in the real numbers with delta greater than zero, such that for all x in x, if d of x and x naught is less than delta, then rho of f of x and f of x naught is less than epsilon. We say that f is continuous if f is continuous at every x naught in x. Hence, let's define continuity of a complex function. Let f from c to c be a function and let z naught be in the complex numbers. We have that f is continuous at z naught if and only if for every epsilon in the reals which is greater than zero, there is some delta in the reals greater than zero, such that for all z in the complex numbers, if the modulus of z minus z naught is less than delta, then the modulus of f of z minus f of z naught is less than epsilon. We say that f is continuous if f is continuous at every z naught in the complex numbers. We now want to discuss open and closed sets, so we need to define an open ball. Let x with d be a metric space, and let a be an x. An open ball around a is any set of the form b sub epsilon superscript d of a, which is the set of all x and x such that the distance from x to a is less than epsilon, where epsilon is a positive real number. Such an open ball is said to be centered on a and have radius epsilon. We often write b subscript epsilon without the superscript d of x, where d is understood to be already known. Hence, let's define an open set. Let x with d be a metric space. A subset o of x is open if and only if for any x in o there is an epsilon greater than zero such that the open ball round x of radius epsilon is a subset of O. Then let's give some remarks for open sets. The union of any collection of open balls is still open. In fact, all open sets are the unions of families of balls. In other words, given a metric space x with d, a subset O of x is open if and only if O is a union of open balls, i.e. if and only if there's a collection ui where i is an i of open balls such that O is equal to the union over all i and i for ui where i is an i. In the complex numbers with the usual Euclidean metric, the open balls are also open disks. Now let's define closed sets. Let x with d be a metric space. A subset c of x is closed if and only if x without c is an open subset of x. Now let's give some results for open and closed set. First, for every metric space x, both x and the empty set are both open and closed. Second, for every discrete metric space x, every subset of x is both open and closed. For any metric space x, the collection of closed subsets of x is closed under arbitrary intersection. Now let's define the closure of a set. For a set A, the closure of A 
is a bar defined to be the intersection over all f such that f is a subset of x which is closed and a is a subset of f. Now we want to give an alternative definition of continuity but first let's give some notation. Given a function f and a set x let f of capital X equal the set of all f of x where x is in x. Now let's give an alternative definition of continuity. Suppose that x with d and y with rho are metric spaces and f from x to y is a function. We say that f is continuous at x0 in x if and only if for every open set o in y with f of x0 in o there is an open set u in x containing x0 such that f of capital U is a subset of O. We say f is continuous if it is continuous at every x0 in f. Next, let's give the components of complex functions. Every complex function f can be expressed in terms of two real functions in the form f is equal to u plus iv where u is a function from the real squared to the reals and v is a function from the real squared to the reals. These are called the components of f. We say that u is the real component and v is the imaginary component. Hence, let's Let's describe how the continuity of real and complex functions relate. Let f from the complex numbers to the complex numbers be given by f of x plus i y is equal to u of x y plus i v of x y where x y, u of x, y, and v of x, y are all real numbers. Let a plus i, b be a complex number. Then f is continuous at a plus i, b if and only if u from r cross r to r is continuous at a, b and v from r cross r to r is continuous at a, b as well. Now let's move on to defining uniform continuity. Suppose that x with d and y with rho are metric spaces, f goes from x to y, and a is a subset of x. We say f is uniformly continuous on a if for every epsilon greater than zero there is a delta greater than zero such that for all x naught and x in a if d of x and x naught is less than delta then rho of f of x and f of x naught is less than epsilon. Note that the value of delta depends only on epsilon and not on the choice of x naught unlike the definition of just continuity. Also uniform continuity is defined using subsets of the Space rather than single points x0. Next, let's give some results for uniform continuity. We have that any continuous function defined on a closed interval is uniformly continuous. Similarly, for complex numbers, any continuous function defined on a closed disk is uniformly continuous. Now, Let's move on to defining a compact set. Given a metric space x and a in x, a is compact if and only if for every collection u of ui where i is an i of open sets such that a is a subset of the union over all i in i of ui, there is some i1 to im, some m in the natural numbers, such that a is a subset of u i1 all the way up to the union of u i m. Next, let's give some remarks for compact set. If x is a metric space, then every compact subset of x is closed. Every closed subset of a compact set is itself compact. If x and y are metric spaces, a is a subset of x which is compact and f is a function from x to y which is continuous then f of capital A is a compact subset of y and f is uniformly continuous on A. Now let's define boundedness. A subset of a metric space is bounded if and only if it is contained in an open ball. Next we can state the hein borel theorem. Let A be a subset of r to the n for some n in the natural numbers. Then A is compact if and only if A is closed and bounded. Then let's give an application of the hein borel theorem. Suppose n is a natural number and that a is closed and bounded subset of r to the n with respect to the usual Euclidean metric. Suppose y in rho is a metric space and f from a to y is continuous. Then f is uniformly continuous on a. Now let's move on to reviewing the definition of convergence. A sequence a n is said to converge to a point a if for all epsilon greater than zero there exists a capital n such that for all lowercase n greater than or equal to capital N, the modulus of a n minus a is less than epsilon. In this case, we say that a is the limit of a n. Note that a sequence may converge to at most one limit. Hence, let's define an accumulation point. A point a is an accumulation point of the sequence a n if and only
only if for every epsilon greater than zero, the set of all n in the natural numbers such that the modulus of a n minus a less than epsilon is infinite. Now let's give some results for accumulation point. First, a convergent sequence has exactly one accumulation point, which is the limit of the sequence. And a point is an accumulation point of a sequence if and only if it is the limit of a subsequence of the sequence. Next, let's define a bounded sequence. We say that a sequence a n is bounded if there is some a and some real number epsilon greater than zero, such that the modulus of a n minus a is less than epsilon for all n. In other words, a n is bounded if its range, the set of all a n for n in the natural numbers, is bounded. Now, let's state the bolzano weierstrass theorem. Suppose that a n is a bounded sequence in the complex numbers, then it has at least one accumulation point. Next, let's discuss how convergence of real and complex functions relate. For every n, let Zn equal An plus Ibn, where Nan and Bn are real sequences. Then Zn converges in the complex numbers if and only if both sequences An and Bn converge in the real numbers. In that case, the limit as n approaches infinity of Zn is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of An plus I times the limit n approaches infinity of Bn. Then, let's give some results for complex sequences. Let Zn and Wn be two convergent complex sequences and let let C be a complex number. Then Zn plus Wn converges, and the limit of Zn plus Wn is equal to the limit of Zn plus the limit of Wn. Also, Zn times Wn converges, and the limit of Zn times Wn is equal to the limit of Zn times the limit of Wn. And C times Zn converges, and the limit of C times Zn is C times the limit of Zn. Now, let's move on to defining a Cauchy sequence. A sequence An is a Cauchy sequence if and only if if for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists an capital N such that for all N and M greater than capital N, the modulus of AN minus AM is less than epsilon. Next, let's give a result for a Cauchy sequence. A sequence AN in the reals or the complex numbers converges if and only if it's a Cauchy sequence. Now, let's move on to defining a series. A series of complex numbers is an expression of the form the sum for all n greater than or equal to zero of Zn, where Zn is a complex number for all n. Given m, the nth partial sum of the sum over all n greater than or equal to zero of Zn is equal to Sm, which is the sum from n is equal to naught to m is equal to n of Zn. We say that the sum over all n greater than zero of Zn converges if and only if the limit as n tends to infinity of Sn exists. In that case we call A the sum of the series, the sum over all Zn. Now let's give an adaptation to the definition of a series. Sometimes we consider series of the form the sum over all n greater than or equal to capital N of Zn for some given natural number capital N greater than zero. We then naturally mean by this series the sum over all n greater than or equal to zero of z dash n, where z dash n is equal to zero if n is less than capital N, and z dash n is equal to zn for all n greater than or equal to capital N. Next, let's give some results for complex series. First, a complex series, the sum over all n of zn converges if and only if, letting zn equal a n plus i b n, with a n and b n in the real number for all n, both the sum over all n of a n and the sum over all n of b n converge as a series of real numbers. Let the sum over all n of z n and the sum over all n of u n be complex series and let c be a complex number. If both the sum over all n of z n and the sum over all n of u n convergence, then the sum over all n of z n plus u n converges and the sum over all n of z n plus u n is equal to the sum over all n of z n plus the sum over all n of u n. If the sum over all n of Zn converges, then the sum over all n of C times Zn converges, and the sum over all n of C times Zn is equal to C times the sum over all n of Zn. Do be aware though, that it's not true in general, that if the sum over all n of Z 
Zn and the sum over all n of Wn are convergent series, then the sum over all Zn times Wn is equal to the sum over all Zn times the sum over all Wn. Next, let's give a necessary condition for a series to converge. A necessary but not sufficient condition for the sum over all n of Zn to converge is that the limit as n approaches infinity of Zn equals zero. However, now let's give a necessary and sufficient condition for convergence. A sequence An converges if and only if the limit as n and m approach infinity of the modulus of An minus Am is equal to zero. A series, the sum over all n of Zn, converges if and only if the limit as n and m approach infinity of Zm plus all the way up to Zn equals zero. Now let's move on to defining absolute convergence. A series, the sum over all n of Zn, converges absolutely if the sum over all n of the modulus of Zn also converges. Next, let's give results for absolute convergence. Absolute convergence implies convergence, but the converse is in general not true. The result of rearranging the terms of an absolutely convergent series in any way is another Another absolutely convergent series with the same sum. Now let's move on to give results for geometric series. For z not equal to 1 and capital N in the natural numbers, the sum from n equals 0 to n of z to the n is equal to 1 minus z to the n plus 1 divided by 1 minus z. Therefore, the geometric series, the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of z to the n, converges to 1 over 1 minus z exactly when the modulus of z is less than 1. Now, let's move on to defining a sequence of a function converging pointwise. Suppose that we have a sequence fn of functions fn from e to the complex numbers, where e is a subset of the complex numbers which is given, and that for every x in e, the sequence of numbers fn of x converges. Then, we may define the limit function f on e by letting f of x equal the limit as n approaches infinity of fn of x for all x in e. We say that the sequence fn converges pointwise to f. Next, let's define uniform convergence for a sequence of functions. Let e be a subset of the complex numbers. A sequence fn of functions fn from e to the complex numbers converges uniformly to a function f if for any epsilon greater than zero there is an n such that for all x in e, if n is greater than n, then the modulus of f of n of x minus f of x is less than epsilon. The difference with pointwise convergence is that for any epsilon greater than zero, we have one n which is uniformly works for all x. Now, let's give a result for uniform convergent sequences of functions. Suppose that a sequence fn of a continuous function converges uniformly to a function f, then f is continuous. This theorem is not true in general for convergent sequences of continuous functions. Next, let's define uniform convergence of a series of functions. Let fn from e to the complex numbers be functions for all n greater than or equal to zero, where e is a subset of the complex numbers. We say that the series of functions, the sum from all n greater than or equal to zero of fn, converges uniformly if the sequence gn converges uniformly for gn of z is equal to the sum over all k greater than zero up to n of fn k of z. In other words, if and only if for every epsilon in the reals greater than zero, there is some n such that for all n greater than m greater than n and all z in e, the modulus of f of m of z plus all the way up to f of n of z is less than epsilon. Next, let's define a majorant. Given a series the sum over all n of f of n of x of functions and a series the sum over all n a n of positive real numbers, we say that the sum over all n of a n is a majorant for the sum over all n of fn of x if there is a constant m such that for all n for all n greater than n and all x we have the modulus of fn of x is less than or equal to m of a n we say that m is a coefficient of majorization then let's state the Weierstrass m test suppose that a n is a sequence of positive real numbers such that the sum over all n of a n is a majorant of the sum over all n of fn of x and 
such that the sum over all a n converges, then the sum over all n of f n of x converges uniformly. Next, let's give some tests for the convergence of series. Suppose that a n and b n are positive real numbers for all n. First, let's state the comparison test. It says that if a n is less than or equal to b n for all large enough n, then the convergence of the series of b n implies the convergence of the series of a n. Second, let's state the ratio test. Suppose that the limit as n approaches infinity of a n plus 1 divided by a n is equal to r. If r is less than 1, then the series of a n converges. If r is greater than 1, then the series of a n diverges. If r is equal to 1, then the series may or may not converge. Third, let's state the ratio comparison test. If for all large enough n, a n plus 1 divided by a n is less than or equal to b n plus 1 divided by b n, then the convergence of the series of b n implies the convergence of the series of a n. Now, let's move on to defining a power series. A power series is a function series of the form the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of a n times z minus a to the n for some constants a 0, a 1, etc. and a. Then, let's define the lim sup and the lin imp. Suppose that a n is a sequence of positive real numbers. Then, the lin sup of a n is equal to a if and only if a is the supremum of the set of all accumulation points of a n, i.e. the supremum of the set of all limits of the subsequences of a n. We define lim imp of a n as the infimum of the set of all accumulation points of a n. Now, let's give some notation. If x, a subset of the real numbers, is unbounded, then we write the supremum of x as infinity. We may also thus write the lim sup of a n equals infinity if the supremum of the accumulation points of an is unbounded. Now, let's give some results for lim sup and lin imp. Let an be a sequence of reals. If the limit of an exists, then the lim sup of an equals the lim imp of an, which is equal to the limit of an. If b is greater than the lim sup of an and an is bounded, then all but finitely many points of an are less than bn. Next, let's discuss Adamard's formula for the radiance of convergence. Let a a1, A2, etc. be complex numbers and define the number r to be r is equal to 1 over the lim sup of the modulus of a n to the power 1 over n. Then the power series, the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of a n times z minus a to the n, converges absolutely for all z such that the modulus of z minus a is less than r. And the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of a n times z minus a to the n converges uniformly on the disk z minus a is less than or equal to r for all r less than r. Also, the sequence of a n times z minus a to the n is unbounded for the modulus of z minus a greater than r, so in particular the series, the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of a n times z minus a to the n, is divergent. Thus, we see that the set of points where power series converges consists of a disk of all z in the complex numbers such that the modulus of z minus a is less than r, and a possible subset of its boundary. We call r the radius of convergence of the series. The circle, the set of all z in the complex numbers such that the modulus of z minus a is equal to r is called the circle of convergence. Note that r equals infinity is allowed where according to our notation we set 1 over 0 to infinity and 1 over infinity to 0. To calculate r, here's a useful limit. We have that the limit as n approaches infinity of n to the 1 over n is equal to 1. Next, let's give some results for the radius of convergence. Given any two power series, the sum from n greater than or equal to 0 of a n times z minus a to the n and the sum from n equals naught of b n times z minus b to the n, if there is some m in the natural numbers such that a n is equal to b n for all n greater than or equal to m, then the series of all n greater than or equal to 0 of a n times z minus a to the n and the sum over all n greater than or equal to 0 of b n times z minus b to the n have the same radius of convergence. Let the series over all n greater than or equal to 0 of a n times times z minus a to the n be a power series and let its radius of convergence be capital R. Suppose that the limit as n approaches infinity 
of the modulus of a n minus a n plus 1 equals lowercase r, then capital R equals lowercase r. Now, let's move on to defining a holomorphic function. Let E be a subset of the complex numbers which is open, and let f from E to the complex numbers be a function. We say that f is differentiable at z if and only if the limit as h approaches 0 of f of z plus h minus f of z divided by h exists. In other words, there is some a complex number such that for all real epsilon greater than zero there is a positive real delta such that for all h if the modulus of h is less than delta and x plus h is in e then the modulus of f of z plus h minus f of z divided by h minus a is less than epsilon. We say that f is holomorphic at z if and only if there is an open set O, a subset of E, such that Z is in O and such that F is a differentiable at W for every W in O. We say that F is holomorphic on E if and only if F is holomorphic at every Z in E. Note that if E is a subset of the complex numbers which is open and F goes from E to the complex numbers, then F is holomorphic on E if and only if f is differentiable at every point in E. Now, let's discuss how power series and holomorphic functions relate. Let the series over all n greater than or equal to zero of a n times z minus a to the n be a power series with radius of convergence r. For z such that the modulus of z minus a is less than r, let f of z equal the series over all n greater than or equal to zero of a n minus z minus a to the n, then f of z is a holomorphic function. Also, f dash of z is the sum of the series obtained from the series over all n greater than or equal to zero of a n times z minus a to the n by differentiating each term, i.e f dash of z is equal to the sum over all n greater than or equal to 1 of n times a n times z minus a to the n minus 1, which is equal to the sum over all n greater than or equal to 0 of n plus 1 times a n plus 1 times z minus a to the n. The series, the sum over all n greater than or equal to 0 of n plus 1 times a n plus 1 times z minus a to the n, has the same radius of convergence as the sum over all n greater than or equal to 0 of a n times z minus a to the n. Also, if f is holomorphic on the region E containing z0, then for any open ball centered at z0 and contained in E, we have that for any z in the open ball, f of z is equal to the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of the nth derivative of f at z0 divided by n factorial times z minus z0 to the n. Now, let's move on to discussing the cauchy riemann equation. The complex differentiability of f of x plus i y equaling f of x and y at z implies not only that the partial derivatives of f exist there, but also that they satisfy the cauchy riemann equations, the partial derivative of f with respect to x is equal to minus i times the partial derivative of f with respect to y. If f equals u plus iv, then this equation is equivalent to the system, the partial derivative of u with respect to x is equal to the partial derivative of u with respect to y, and the partial derivative of v with respect to x is equal to minus the partial derivative of u with respect to y. We therefore get the following result. If f equals u plus iv is holomorphic on E, where U goes from E to the real numbers, and V goes from E to the real numbers, then the cauchy riemann equations are satisfied there. And for every A plus IB in E, F dash of Z is equal to partial derivative of U with respect to X at a plus ib plus i times the partial derivative of v with respect to x at a plus ib. Also, we get this result. Let e be an open subset of the complex numbers and let f from e to the complex numbers be a function. If the partial derivatives of f exist and are continuous on e and the cauchy riemann equations are satisfied there, then f is a holomorphic function on e. Now, Let's define a locally constant function. A function f is locally constant on E if E can be written as the union of disjoint open sets on each of which the function is constant. Then we get the following result for locally constant functions. If f from E to the complex numbers is a holomorphic function, E is open, then f dash is the zero function on E if and only if f is locally constant. Also, if f is a complex function on an open set E such that both f and f bar are holomorphic, then f is locally constant on E. And as ever, thank you for watching.